Good morning. We'll try again. Good morning. That's a little better. Uh, good. Nice to see you. Uh, let's get started. We're just a little bit uh, late here getting started, and we're supposed to stick to the time, so we will. Um, so, uh, welcome to this. My name is Marshall Gannon, and I'll be working with you for the next hour or so on uh, public merit and, and how it works. Well, let me just get an idea of uh, who's here. Uh, who's here from outside the U.S.? From oh, oh, interesting. From where? Where? Albania. Yeah. Italy. Yeah. Costa Rica. Yeah. Colombia. Yeah. Kosovo. Yeah. Germany. Where? Germany. Germany. Yeah. Canada. Yeah. Australia. Yeah. Nigeria. Nigeria. Canada. Korea. Yeah. Liberia. Wow. Wow. Pretty good. Now, how about from the U.S.? Let's see. <laughs> right, the remainder. How about from the West? The West Coast? Uh, no. The Midwest? How about from the Northeast? Oh, okay. All right, okay. All right, just trying to get a sense of who's here and who we're working with. Uh, well, uh, we are prepared for the international uh, participation, as you can see, uh, because one of the discoveries, one of the experiences that I've had over the last few years is discovering just how, um, how uh, I don't want to, I, I hesitate the word universal, because, uh, but how, uh, I've yet to find a cultural context in which people don't tell stories, in which they don't use stories for, to solve very similar problems and questions, uh, and so what you see here is a result of uh, people in various parts of the world using public narrative in different ways uh, in their language and in their context uh, to do work of leadership development. Um, let me just set the context a little bit. Um, public narrative is a, uh, a leadership skill, a leadership practice, but it's rooted in a notion of leadership that, well, the, the hazard here is that as many different sessions on leadership as you attend, you'll find different definitions. So let me give you mine. Uh, the, my approach to leadership is based on three questions posed by a, a first century Jerusalem scholar, Rabbi Hillel, who um, asked, uh, when asked, how do I figure out what to do in the world, he responded with three questions. The first question was, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? Uh, which is not a selfish statement, but it is self-regarding. It's saying if you presume to lead, you better know something about what you're about. You better know something about the values, the resources, what's, what's moving you but you're going to have to give account of that. The second question he says to ask yourself is, if I am for myself alone, what am I? Which is suggests that to be a who and not a what is to recognize that we exist in the world in relationship with others, and that our capacity to realize our objectives is wrapped up inextricably with the capacity of others to realize theirs, so we exist in relationship in the world. And thirdly, he says, ask yourself, if not now, when? which is not advice to jump off a bridge, but it is, uh, it does draw attention to the fact that we can rarely learn what we need to learn to be effective at what we hope to do without actually doing it. In other words, learning flows from action, it doesn't precede action. And, and so, in my understanding, leadership really is about the relationship among those three elements, uh, the self, the other, and action, and how they interact with each other. Now, it's also important, though, that, he, <coughs> that he, he responded with questions and not answers. He didn't say, here's the answer, folks. He says, here's some questions to ask yourself. Well, in, and that makes sense, too, because if you think about the domain of leadership, <coughs> is it when everything is working? Is it when everything's functioning fine? Everything's okay? No problems? What do you need leadership for? Everything's, everything's, clear, everything's fine. It's when things are broken, uh, contradictory, dilemmas, problems, novel, unexpected. That's the domain in which leadership is required. It's the domain of the uncertain, not the certain. So it means that it's much more about encountering uncertainty and finding purpose through it than it is about trying to assert control or, or try to operate within a domain of control. Now that's kind of scary because it means operating, it means accepting as a given Uncertainty, the unexpected. This is a, a domain in which it's not all clear. It's not all nailed down. That's kind of scary. It, it's challenging to the hands in, in the sense, how, how will I know I have the skills I need to deal with these new challenges, much less enable others to? 
Uh, it's a challenge to the head. How can I use my resources in new ways to deal with these challenges? Or can I? Which is a strategic challenge, challenge to the head. Uh, and it's a challenge, um, and it's a challenge to the heart. Uh, how do I find the courage? How do I find the hopefulness? Uh, how do I inspire others with the hopefulness and the courage to take risks to deal with the unexpected and the novel in constructive ways? So come to think of leadership then as having three dimensions, the head dimension, the hands dimension, and the heart dimension. And as, as defined in this way, accepting responsibility, because there's a choice to accept responsibility to lead or not, uh, accepting responsibility to enable others. So this is not a diva idea of leadership. This is not leader as, as charismatic son that illuminates all who come close with some heat. That's not it. It's a form of social interaction with other people to achieve purpose under conditions of uncertainty. Accepting responsibility for enabling others to achieve shared purpose under conditions of uncertainty. Um, and that means it's thinking of leadership less as a position or a person as a practice, as a way of doing things, a way of engaging, uh, a way of engaging purposefully. And of course, we all know examples of people in positions of authority who are awful leaders. But we also come across people who have no positions of authority and exercise leadership all the time, whether from a kitchen table or a small neighborhood store or whatever it might be. So I want to be clear, what we're focusing on here is the practice of leadership and practicing leadership uh, in these circumstances. Narrative is the way in which, a way in which we learn to mobilize the emotional resources to act purposefully, to choose pur purposefully in the face of challenge. And that's what we're going to focus on. And public narrative is a way of harnessing the power of narrative to the work of leadership through uh, developing what I call a story of self, a story of us, and a story of now, and bringing them all together. And that's what we're going to work on today. Now, uh, this uh, public narrative stuff, the self us now, wasn't so he wasn't invented at the Kennedy School. Um, the first instance I know of it was um, in Exodus 8, uh, actually, uh, where um, Moses is kind of an interesting character to me because he, he was a Jew who was an Egyptian. He was of the oppressed but raised in the house of the oppressor, which gave him some real identity issues. And, uh, and, uh, and, when, he, and when he confronted that, that sort of contradiction, uh, he didn't know how to handle it. He, 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 his rage took over. He killed somebody. He had to flee. He fled, fled off to the desert, which in the Bible is where you go to figure stuff out. And uh, there he found uh, a, a wife, a father-in-law, uh, and became a shepherd. And one day he's walking along uh, with his sheep, um, and he sees this glow off the side of the road. And he's a curious guy, and he's kind of courageous. He steps off the road to see what this glow is. And it turns out to be this bush, and it's burning, but it's not being consumed. And at that point, he hears a voice, Moses, or Moses, we're not sure. There's some, there's some theological contention about, about exactly how the voice sounded. Yeah, you're being called to go to step up and exercise leadership and free your people. And what's, for those familiar with the text, what's the first question Moses asks? What's your name? Uh, first question is, why me? Why me? I'm not able. I'm not equipped. I don't have the skills. I don't. Why are you picking me? <laughs> then the next question. Oh, wait a second. Um, who are you? <laughs> and who are these people? And 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 third question. Couldn't this wait a little bit? <laughs> Got to do it now. That's when God negotiates with him and gives him magic tricks and his brother and so forth to help him along. My only point is that this question about the relationship of self to other to action is an old question, old set of questions, and you find them being asked everywhere. First time I asked myself these questions was when I was a junior here at Harvard College in 1964. I am shocked to say we're having our 50th reunion this year. It's kind of remarkable, actually. Um, uh, and uh, I volunteered for the Mississippi Summer Project, uh, which then took me away from Harvard to Mississippi uh, and introduced me to the Civil Rights Movement and to the work that I was going to be doing for the next 28 years, actually, the work of organizing. Uh, and uh, after sort of getting educated about race, power, and politics in America and Mississippi, went back home, where I'd grown up in California, Bakersfield, California, the southern end of the San Joaquin Valley, uh, where, uh, and uh, 
this, uh, Cesar Chavez had just started a grape strike 30 miles from there, organizing migrant uh, farm workers uh, to form a union. And I'd grown up in that world but hadn't seen it. I had to go to Mississippi and get educated about race, power, and politics in this country to see a very similar situation right where I had grown up. People of color with no real political rights, no economic protections, and California with its own rich history of racial segregation going back to the turn of the century with the Chinese. And it became evident that Mississippi was not an example, not an exception to America, but an example of the America that needed to be changed. Began working with Caesar, did that for the next 16 years, which is where I learned the craft, and then another 10 years of union issue electoral organizing, and then became stuck. And that's when I got invited to my 25th reunion here at Harvard. Uh, Harvard's very smart about the 25th reunion. Um, they figured two things have happened. Um, <laughs> he's laughing. You have a kid and you've made money. The convergence <laughs> gives Harvard a real interest, right? This is like how it works. Now, it wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't so in my case, but I came to that reunion. Uh, and coming to that reunion, I'd never been to one before. It was like running into a 20-year-old version of me that was still here. And 20-year-old me said, well, how's it going? I said, well, I'm feeling kind of stuck. And 20-year-old me said, why don't you come back and finish the senior year? You never finished when you left to go, go down to Mississippi in 1964. And so I don't know if I, my brain will still work. I went to see one of the deans the last day. And if he'd laughed at me, that would have, I was so fragile, it would have been the end of it. But uh, he was an Episcopal priest, it turned out. We talked for three hours. Uh, we discussed the fact tuition had changed a little bit in the interview. <laughs> uh, and eventually, I came back in 1991 and uh, finished my senior year in history and government, wrote a senior thesis. I'd done the field work and graduated class of 64-92. And my 81-year-old and my mother got to uh, come and see her son finally become a college graduate. We got to close that loop came here to the Kennedy School to do a mid, the mid-career program. I think I'm only the only person who went from senior to mid-career in one, one summer. <laughs> and, uh, and, then, uh, and then began work on my PhD in sociology here. And while working on my PhD, was asked to design a course on organizing here at the Kennedy School, which turned out to be a huge gift to me, because it was a way to integrate my life experience in the social science in a conversation with a rising generation. I, I came to think of going to class as Wow, you get to have a conversation with the future like two times a week. That's kind of cool. And it is. And now, increasingly, it's a conversation with the world, given the composition of who our students are here now from all over. Finished the PhD in 2000, and have been on the faculty full time here since then. I teach organizing in the spring, teach uh, public narrative in the fall. Uh, and also, we're just finishing uh, the fifth year of a distance learning class in organizing. Uh, right now we have 110 students in some 23 countries around the world uh, also learning organizing over the internet, which has been a very exciting new dimension to explore. So that's how I come to be here, but as I've reflected on why, you know, it, it's, um, uh, we lived in Germany for three years after the Second World War when my, uh, my father was a chaplain. He was a rabbi. He was a chaplain then in the American Army. Uh, and they, they brought the families over. and. Um, we, uh, so we lived in Germany from, from 46 to 49, and his work was mostly with Holocaust survivors. I met people coming through the house who'd suffered that horror. Um, my fifth birthday party was actually in a camp, um, and a camp, but it was a DP camp, a displaced person camp, and it was all children. And it was my mother's idea that I should give gifts rather than get them. It was not my idea. <laughs> I was kind of charmed with the fact that there were no parents until confronted with the reality as to why there were no parents. They'd been killed. And it, it sort of brought us face to face with the reality of that horror. But my parents interpreted the Holocaust to me not as being simply about anti-Semitism but about racism and that racism kills. And it's very simple. It's not a complicated ideological question. It kills. You objectify other people. You make them more than less. Anything can happen. And that's, that's what the civil rights movement was fighting. Uh, and, and that was certainly part of it. And part of it was growing up as a, as a rabbi's kid. You've got to go to all the religious services. You've got to, supposed to be perfect, which is another set of issues. But, <laughs> but I love the Passover Seders, which were the retelling of the story of the journey from slavery to freedom with food, which was kind of nice. But there's a part where they point to the children and they say, you were slaves in Egypt. And it puzzled me because I hadn't been a slave, I hadn't been to Egypt, until I realized what it meant was that, that story was not the property of one people, time, 
or place, but rather one told every generation. And you got to sort of figure out where you are in that story. And, in, and when I was a junior in college here, that story was being told by the Civil Rights Movement explicitly. And uh, so, and, and I think the third thing is that there's something about, uh, about generation change. Uh, Walter Brueggemann, the Protestant theologian, wrote a book uh, called The Prophetic Imagination, in which he, he says transformational vision occurs at the intersection of two elements. One is criticality, and the other is hope. In other words, a clear sense of the world's heart, but also of its possibilities. And, and the two is what it takes to actually move, move forward. And uh, young people come of age with a critical eye on the world, they find, and almost of necessity, hopeful heart. And that's what moved my generation. And now I have the privilege of working with people whose generation is being moved about other challenges, other concerns, but equally uh, uh, striving for, grasping for this capacity for change. So that's how I come to be here and doing what I'm doing. Now, let's get into public narratives specifically. Um, in my years uh, as an organizer, I was always interested in strategy because we were always David dealing with Goliath. At least that's how we perceived it. And so David doesn't have the resources Goliath does. He has to be more resourceful. And so strategic imagination and strategic creativity was always of great interest to me. But along with that, though, um, was the question of showing up. In other words, you have a great strategy. Oh, we know what to do. Nobody shows up. The question of motivation of what gives people courage, the courage to act, the courage to act together, to trust one another. That was central to the work I've done all those years. And so when I came back to school, I was very interested in both of those questions and discovered that uh, their psychologists had in fact studied this. In particular, Jerome Bruner at the School of Education had done a lot of work understanding the relationship between the cognitive way we map the world, first chart over there, and the affective way. And the cognitive mapping of the world, of where things are in relation to other things, very important. It's useful for figuring out the answer to the question, how do we do something? How? Efficiency. Pathways. How do we do it? Doesn't tell us much about why, though. The other form of mapping, the, the affective, the emotional mapping, uh, this inspires me. This disgusts me. This, get, this frightens me. This lifts me up. This moves me. This doesn't touch me. That affective mapping of the world is how we actually attach value to the people, things, and experience of the world. And it's that second domain where we go to answer the question, why do I care? Why does it matter? Why does it matter enough that I will take risks in order to do X, Y, Z? So the, the, that second domain that affective domain is the domain in which narrative exists and in which narrative works. It's the domain of emotion. Now, this requires getting clear that, that to talk about values, is, it's not an exercise in abstract intellectualizing. Values talk to be real is emotional. It's in the language of emotion. It's about feelings. It's about emotional commitments. Martha Nussbaum, uh, the moral philosopher who um, wrote uh, Unsub in her book, Unsettled Thoughts, she writes about uh, people with damaged amygdalas uh, who can't experience much emotion. Uh, they can reason options till they're blue in the face, but you know what they can't do? What do you think? They can't decide. Because decisions rest on value judgments, and value judgments require emotional information. So the understanding here is not that Oh, emotion, we need to keep it under control so we can be these very rational creatures over here. But rather that emotion is central to why we make the choices we make. So let's understand it and let's engage with it and, and understand how it works and what the language of emotion is so we can understand something about what actually moves us and moves others to act. Now we know that there are certain emotions that inhibit uh, purposeful or mindful action and other emotions facilitate it. For example, most of the time we're on autopilot. Most of the time we're operating just, you know, on habit. It's very efficient, right? We evolved that way. So I don't have to relearn how to drive the car every time I get in the car. I'm operating on habit. Very helpful. Very helpful. I'm driving the car down the street, and along comes a truck and pulls in front, and I'm on autopilot. Uh, not so good. 
So we've developed uh, what we call, what the, in our brains, what's called a surveillance system, which is a way of detecting the unexpected, detecting anomaly, the surprise. And so that truck pulls out, and my brain goes, truck, truck, truck. And I experience that as anxiety, and that's really helpful because it tells me, pay attention. This is not the ordinary. You need to figure out what you're going to do in this circumstance. And so the first thing to get clear on here is that in order to move ourselves or others to new pathways of action, not to the repetition of habit as it always is, requires being able to create anxiety. It sounds crazy, but no, that's exactly right. And, and so how do we create anxiety? Well, one way is through urgency, making things urgent, you know? It's due tomorrow morning, I'm sorry, yeah, you gotta make a life decision, but these problem sets due tomorrow. What are you gonna do? Problem set. How to connect the important and the urgent in our lives is one of the big challenges. It's certainly a big challenge with climate change movement, that, that's for sure. And so because we, urgency moves us to act, it's a prioritization. It's an emotional prioritization, not just an intellectual one. Anger, uh, another one. And by anger, I don't mean rage, but I do mean outrage. I mean the dissonance between our experience of the world as it is and the world as it ought to be. Who did not hear of the, of the, of the Boko Haram uh, uh, events in northern Nigeria, of the kidnapping of those young women, and was not outraged? To not be outraged is to ask yourself, well, what's, what's wrong here? There's a dissonance that creates a tension that can be resolved ultimately only through action. That's positive, that's constructive, that breaks through the domain of habit. So let's say you do a great job of making everybody anxious around you, okay, through it. <laughs> then the question becomes, what do you do with that? And so consider what our hardwired, what our default response to anxiety is. What is it? What's our default response? Something's threatening, what do we do? Well, we, if we can, we'll strike out. <laughs> We'll run away, or we'll freeze and hope it doesn't notice us, right? Fight, flight, freeze. That's, that's what we're hardwired for. Now, in the days when we were wandering around the plains wherever they were, that was pretty functional. Once we started to live with other people in communities uh, and, and build civilizations, it became pretty dysfunctional. The reaction of fight, flight, or freeze becomes, in fact, destructive because it's a reaction. It's not a thoughtful response. It's a reaction. Culture, through our culture, we developed a capacity to respond and not simply react. We developed ways in which to access sources of hopefulness that can trump the fear. Sources of solidarity or love that can trump the isolation that goes with fear. Sources of ikmat, ikmat, you can make a difference. Self-efficacy uh, that can trump the feelings of self-doubt that cause us to react. So if we're going to engage with challenges, on the one hand, the challenge has got to be real, but on the other hand, we have to find the emotional resources to access sources of hope and sources of solidarity and sources of self-efficacy so that we are able to respond and not react and respond purposefully. Does this make sense? Yes. And seeing by hope, uh, I don't mean flowers in May. I, uh, uh, Maimonides, a 12th century philosopher, had a definition of hope I like a lot, which says, Hope is belief in the plausibility of the possible as opposed to the necessity of the probable. Let me say that again. He's saying to be a realist is to recognize that the world is not only a place of probability. It is always probable Goliath will win, but you know what? Sometimes David does. That we also exist in a world of possibility. And that sense of possibility in our own lives, our own experiences, our encounters with others is precious. Because that's what gives us a sense that it can be other than what is expected, predicted, and told it will be. That's what I mean by hopefulness. So now, what does narrative have to do with this? Well, over there you have a little chart of that expressionless character being confronted by a very frightening challenge. Uh, and. Uh, uh, and has to make a choice uh, to which there's an outcome. Narrative, uh, all, all narratives are, I mean, narrative worldwide has three elements. It has a character, a protagonist of some kind, it has a plot, and it has uh, a moral. And it, it, now, what makes a plot a plot? So I got up this morning, got in my car, and came here. Really exciting, right? You want to know what happened next? I mean, you, you're on the edge of your seat, it's just like, you can't. 
All right, so what would make it a plot? What would get, make it a plot? What happened? The car accident. The car accident. Mine or somebody else's? <laughs> oh, even more. Okay. Yeah, I was just, I did, got in the car and was just rounding the corner when I saw a herd of porcupines running across the street. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. I put on my brakes. I wound up smashing into the other car and there were porcupines everywhere. And you didn't know about the annual porcupine invasion. No, okay. That's silly. It didn't get interesting, though, did it? It got interesting. It started getting... So why? Why does the entry of, of that kind of a, of a moment engage you where the first one was totally boring? What's the difference? Huh? So why do you care? Why, I mean, why would you... Just think about the billions of dollars we spend each year to, 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 you know, from movies and plays and books that essentially are all this. So it's out of the ordinary. So what? Why? So next time when parking ponds are attacking your car, you'll know what to do? I mean, what? why? Why? Why do you care? You just met me. Why do you care? Come on, think about this. This is, this is. The, the, huh? Huh? What, with the, with the, with the parking ponds in the car? Yeah. Is that it? <laughs> is that, no, it could be me. It could be you, but in what? It could be you in what circumstance? In what circumstance? Huh? In what circumstance? Let me ask you, how many times a day do unexpected things happen to you? Little things? They're sold out of tickets at the movie or they don't have seats in the restaurant or whatever. And big things, marriages break up, you know? People get fired from jobs. We lose loved ones. Isn't the challenge of dealing with the unexpected central to the whole human experience? I mean, to be a human being with this gift of agency that we can imagine and remember, that we're aware of, 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 of possibilities and expectations, means that those expectations are often, they, they don't turn out. But we got to deal with it. We don't have a, there's no rule book, there's no manual, but we got to deal with it. That experience of confronting moments of challenge of the unexpected, for which we are not prepared, but yet we know they matter, turns out to be a core question that people ask themselves. Now, narrative is that moment. It's those moments. That's, what, that's what's at the heart of a plot. And because we can identify em empathically with the character, we not only can sort of get an intellectual moral like haste makes waste, we can actually experience haste making waste through empathetic identification, or what we now know are mirror neurons at work, that we can actually experience the experience recounted of another. So the moral that the story teaches is not just to the head, but to the heart, because it's experiential. And that's why families and cultures and faith traditions all teach new stories. They're, they're teaching the heart. They're teaching us how to manage the heart, how to access values, sources that can give us hope that can give us a sense of, of, of possibility, of, of, of capability, and of efficacy. And so, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, um, think, where'd you hear your first story? Yeah. In church? Okay. Home? Did you hear them? You know, families have these stories. Uh, you know, um, let me tell you about Uncle Charlie. You know, he started out on the right path, but then, yeah, you know, he went wrong. But I'll tell you about Aunt Harriet, you know, now over here. She, everybody's got these stories. Bruner, who studied this, says like 85% of the time that parents spend with young children is in storytelling. Why? To distract them? Well, not really. It's teaching kids how to be agents, how to become choiceful human beings. And it's the emotional content of that teaching is what narrative teaches. So now, Public narrative is a way of harnessing that power to the work of leadership. By using narrative to communicate to others, what am I doing here? What, you know, why, why have I been called? Not my resume, but who am I? And to remind others of values they share that make them who they are. And to confront them with the challenge to those values that requires action and a source of hope. self us now. So we're going to look at a couple of examples now. And the first example we're going to look at is one you may have seen before. And um, we can get ready to show you. 
This was here in Boston 10 years ago. Uh, the Democratic Convention. Oh, uh, hang on. Hold it. Uh, um, remember this young guy? <laughs> Boy, it makes a difference. Um, putting politics aside, just looking at from the from the standpoint of, uh, of method. Um, so this was when Obama introduced himself to the country and to the world. It's the first time anybody really heard much of him. Uh, now, uh, what I'm going to share with you are the first seven minutes of his talk. Just the first seven minutes. And in those first seven minutes, you will hear a story of self, you will hear a story of us, and you'll hear a story of now. And I want you to note, in, your, in, your, in the handouts we gave you, there's a little guide for, for looking, for watching the Obama talk. It's, uh, what is it? Uh, it's page... Yeah, page nine, yeah. And um, so, first of all, see if you can see where the shift is from the story of self to us, us to now. Second, and, and I shouldn't have distracted with that. Second, uh, <laughs> second, stories are all built around choice moments. That's at the heart of a story. A story is a moment of choice. It is a moment of choice. It's not a description of a moment of choice. It is a moment of choice. Note the moments of choice that he uh, uh, list, uh, draws, draws upon here. Thirdly, pay attention to the details. And fourth, see what values those moments of choice communicate. And then we'll debrief this and then we'll take a look at another. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dick Durbin. You make us all proud. On behalf of the great state of Illinois, crossroads of a nation, land of Lincoln, let me express my deepest gratitude for the privilege of addressing this convention. Tonight is a particular honor for me because, let's face it, my presence on this stage is pretty unlikely. My father was a foreign student, born and raised in a small village in Kenya. He grew up herding goats, went to school in a tin roof shack. His father, my grandfather, was a cook, a domestic servant to the British. But my grandfather had larger dreams for his son. Through hard work and perseverance, my father got a scholarship to study in a magical place, America, that shone as a beacon of freedom and opportunity to so many who had come before. While studying here, my father met my mother. She was born in a town on the other side of the world, in Kansas. Her father worked on oil rigs and farms through most of the Depression. The day after Pearl Harbor, my grandfather signed up for duty, joined Patton's army, marched across Europe. Back home, my grandmother raised a baby and went to work on a bomber assembly line. After the war, they studied on the GI Bill, bought a house through FHA, and later moved west, all the way to Hawaii, in search of opportunity. And they, too, had big dreams for their daughter. A common dream born of two continents. My parents shared not only an improbable love, they shared an abiding faith in the possibilities of this nation. They would give me an African name, Barack, or Blessed, believing that in a tolerant America, your name is no barrier to success. They imagined, they imagined me going to the best schools in the land, even though they weren't rich, because in a generous America, you don't have to be rich to achieve your potential. They're both passed away now. And yet I know that on this night, they look down on me with great pride. They stand here, and I stand here today, 
grateful for the diversity of my heritage, aware that my parents' dreams live on in my two precious daughters. I stand here knowing that my story is part of the larger American story, that I owe a debt to all of those who came before me, and that in no other country on earth is my story even possible. Tonight, we gather to affirm the greatness of our nation. Not because of the height of our skyscrapers, or the power of our military, or the size of our economy. Our pride is based on a very simple premise, summed up in a declaration made over 200 years ago. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is the true genius of America, a faith, a faith in simple dreams, an insistence on small miracles, that we can tuck in our children at night and know that they are fed and clothed and safe from harm that we can say what we think, write what we think, without hearing a sudden knock on the door, that we can have an idea and start our own business without paying a bribe, that we can participate in the political process without fear of retribution, and that our votes will be counted at least most of the time. <laughs> This year, in this election, we are called to reaffirm our values and our commitments, to hold them against a hard reality, and see how we're measuring up to the legacy of our forebears and the promise of future generations. And fellow Americans, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, I say to you tonight, we have more work to do. More work to do for the workers I met in Galesburg, Illinois who are losing their union jobs at the Maytag plant that's moving to Mexico, and now are having to compete with their own children for jobs that pay seven bucks an hour. More to do for the father that I met who was losing his job and choking back the tears, wondering how he would pay $4,500 a month for the drugs his son needs without the health benefits that he counted on. More to do for the young woman in East St. Louis, and thousands more like her who has the grades, has the drive, has the will, but doesn't have the money to go to college. Now, don't get me wrong, the people I meet in small towns and big cities and diners and office parks, they don't expect government to solve all their problems. They know they have to work hard to get ahead, and they want to. Go into the collar counties around Chicago, and people will tell you they don't want their tax money wasted by a welfare agency or by the Pentagon. Go, in, go into any inner city neighborhood and folks will tell you that government alone can't teach our kids to learn. They know that parents have to teach that children can't achieve unless we raise their expectations and turn off the television sets and eradicate the slander that says a black youth with a book is acting white. They know those things. People don't expect, people don't expect government to solve all their problems. But they sense deep in their bones that with just a slight change in priorities, we can make sure that every child in America has a decent shot in life. And that the doors of opportunity remain open to all. They know we can do better. And they want that choice. In this election, we offer that choice. Our party has chosen a man to lead us who embodies the best this country has to offer. And that man is John Kerry. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not everything, not everything works out. <laughs> or maybe it did. It depends on the point of view that you have. But, okay, very quickly, because uh, I want to share another, another uh, video with you to show that this is not just a matter of presence. But um, uh, did you hear a story itself? Yeah. When did it shift to an us? When did he shift? When did he shift to what? Okay. To the us. When did he move from the self to the us? My story is part of the life. My story is part. Story. It was foreshadowed, and there's but but that was a very explicit shift. My story is part of the greater American story. And then when does he shift to the now? 
yeah, we have more work left to do. So here I am, here's who we are, here's the challenge we face. You can see there in seven minutes this, this, uh, this piece put together. What are some of the choices that he uh, refers to uh, in his story of self? What moments of choice does he refer to? What do they refer to? I mean, what does he refer to? What are some of them? Moving west for opportunity. Uh, who? With, with, who was it? Okay, we're talking about, okay, on his mother, so on his mother's family, they did what? All right, so they choose to go west. What, what value is embedded in that? All right, there's some hopefulness there. What, let's stay with his, uh, his uh, mother's uh, parents. What, what other choices does he refer to? Went to school. When did he enlist? When did the grandfather enlist? After Pearl Harbor. Oh, not two weeks after, but day after. Yeah. Why does it matter the day after? He took immediate action. Huh? Oh. And what does that communicate then about his grandfather? Man. 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 Yeah, courage, patriotism, whatever action, right? See, now, and, and what about uh, his grandmother? What was she doing? <laughs> working in the factory. Yeah, and where was she just working? Where was she working? Just any place? No, She's making bombs. She's making bombs. She's making bombs. <laughs> bomber assembly line. <laughs> so, what, what, what sense do you get of her? Tough cookie over here. She's a tough cookie. You know, but a caring person? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Rosie and the Rivet are taking care of the family, too. I mean, see, now, you know, now go over on the other side. What about, what, what about his parents? What about their choices? Courageous. Huh? Courageous. Well, what choice do they make? Get oh, to get married. Uh, you mean everybody wasn't doing that? They're interracial marriage in 51, <laughs> like that, that wasn't a big deal. Uh, what is he has a phrase for it? You know what I'm saying? Unlikely. Improbable love. It's kind of improbable love. What, what sort of values does it suggest then? What drives people to do that sort of thing? Tolerance. Tolerance, yeah. What else? Yeah, uh, well, courage. courage. What, what about naming him? Yeah. What, what does that communicate? Tolerance. Tolerance, but what else? Oh. And what else? Yeah? yeah? And, and how about some sense of heritage? Oh. Yeah. Some sense of dignity that comes with it, too. You, now, what if you see, he could just say, I come from a background of hopeful, courageous people. Move on. <laughs> <laughs> see, what he's done is pick moments. And he really begins his talk with a moment. At the, did anybody catch that right at the beginning? He draws attention to that moment. Do you notice what he says? How unlikely it is that I would even be here. He's sort of saying, hey, folks, not domain of probability. We're now in the domain of possibility. So let's get straight what we're going to talk about. When he shifts to the story of us, where does he go in the story of us? You know. Um, Declaration of Independence. So now all communities, organizations, faith traditions all have uh, founding stories, right? The founders got together and decided, and that reflects values. Now he makes a choice to go to the Declaration of Independence and say, not the Constitution. Why do you think that might be? Any, any thoughts on that? It's less sense. It's what? Less sense. It's less? Um, it's less evocative. It's less. What, the Declaration is less evocative than the Constitution? I mean, this, this, huh? The other way around. Oh, the other way around, yeah. And, and, and what else do you think? Oh, constitution Yeah, constitution legitimated slavery in the U.S. Three-fifths rule, blacks count three-fifths of a white. Declaration of Independence was a call to equality. So he's choosing where he goes depending on the values he wants to mobilize people around. So it's, a, it's an intentionality about this whole thing. When he goes to the story of now, how does he make that real? Is that when he pulls out his Kennedy School regression analyses and statistics? <laughs> how, does, how does he make it real? Talk about jobs. Well, not having jobs. Well, is it, oh, we have a problem of we don't have jobs? He or what? other people's people stories. Examples. Examples. And what do all those examples have in common? There's like three important examples he cites there. They're happening right now, and they just happen to a person. I had a job. I don't have it anymore. I got a kid that needs medicine. I got into college. I don't have the money to go. They're little tiny narrative moments. That's what brings them alive. That's it. And they're particular and specific, and there's a place and there's a time. It is not an exercise in abstraction. It's an exercise in particularity. Because our capacity to experience story 
grows out of our capacity for episodic memory, which is related to our ability to visualize. The more concrete, real, specific, and particular, the more powerful the story. It's, it's like the poem where you access the transcendent through the particular. It's through the particular that opens up the emotional experience that communicates. Now, he ends up here. He's got a challenge. Is there some hope in this story? Where's the hope? John Kerry. Is it in John Kerry? <laughs> Is it really? No, I mean, look, think about it. Where is it really? Is it, is it in him? It's in our Who's got to decide? we got to decide. He's confronting us with a moment of choice. That's the story of now. We are now in a story, folks. It is our moment when we must choose this or that. And then here's a pathway to action. So it isn't one of these, uh, sadly, in the inconvenient cr truth at the end, there was like 43 things you could do. It's like very clear, specific, <laughs> focused choice calling on people to join you in making. Now, I want to show you another example very quickly. Uh, this is one of my students. Um, who's graduating this year, actually, uh, in, uh, he's getting his uh, doctorate at the Ed School, James Croft. And uh, in the public narrative class I teach, uh, the first uh, half, the, the, the first module concludes uh, with each student doing a five-minute story of self us now. They videotape it, and then they write an analysis of their narrative, saying what worked, what didn't work, how it could have been strengthened, or whatever. So now, take a look at how James does this. And note the sequence. You know, Obama went self us now, but you don't have to go self us now. Those threads need to be present. And look how James puts that together. Look how he brings his self a lot, because you may have noted, not a whole lot of Obama himself was in that. There was a lot about where he came from, but not a whole lot. Uh, James puts himself right in it. Uh, and then uh, pay attention to how he does the us work in particular. anything like what Tyler went through when I was at school, but I was bullied for being gay. You see, when I was a kid, I was a ballet dancer, and every week I squeezed into a leotard and blue shiny hot pants. It was uh, quite an outfit, and I spent an evening practicing Debbie PAs and pirouettes, and I loved it. I loved the discipline. The music played on the old piano, the feel of the wood beneath my feet, I even secretly quite liked the outfit. <laughs> but my schoolmates and some of my teachers didn't like ballet as much as I did. And one of my teachers, a PE teacher, used to make fun of me. He used to say how girly I was, how dancing is not something that a boy should do. I remember the sneer on his face as I walked past, and I remember that he was the first person to call me a fag, which at seven years old, I didn't really understand. I remember in high school how gay was only ever used as a term of abuse. And I remember one cold morning sitting in assembly while the principal intoned, homosexuals deserve our pity and our prayers. And I sat among hundreds of other boys thinking I was all alone in the world, and that I was the only one who had this problem. Now, not everyone may have experienced something like that, but we all know, I think, what it means to feel alone, to feel like there's no one on our side. Perhaps you were too tall and the short kids made fun of you. Or perhaps you were too short and you got it from the taller ones. Or perhaps you were too smart or too dumb, or from the wrong side of town, or the wrong race. We all know, I think, even if just for a moment, what it feels like to think that there's no one on your side. 
to think that no one has your back. And all of us, if there are young people in our lives that we care about, can agree that we don't want this to happen to them. Imagine, if you can, what it must be like to come home and see a strange shape hanging from a tree in your backyard, twisting in the wind, the creak of the branch as it bends beneath the weight, and that feeling in your gut as you get closer and you realize what it is hanging there, who it is, who it was, because that was Seth Walsh, 13, who hung himself from a tree in his backyard. It was Billy Lucas who hung himself at his grandmother's house. And it was Raymond Chase who hung himself in his door. And it could have been your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter, or your friend. It could have been one of us. So I know, I, I only came out in March this year. After 10 years, 10 years after I first told my parents that I thought I was gay. And in those 10 years, I lost a lot of opportunities to make a difference. I was a high school teacher, and every day I wasn't out was a day I deprived a gay student of a positive role model. And I'm not willing to waste any more time. I have to act now. We have to act now. Because it isn't enough to let these things happen and then mourn them afterwards. We need to catch these kids before they jump. And there is something we can do to help as a start. Journalist Dan Savage has started a campaign, the It Gets Better campaign, to send messages of hope to teenagers who are being bullied because they're gay or for whatever reason, that they should have hope for their future, that they do have something to live for. And I think that if we made such a video, as Harvard students with glittering careers ahead of us and sparkling degrees, then we could make a difference. So we need people to hold a camera, to share their stories, to do anything that sounds, to stand in a big group and say it gets better. No contribution is too small. And if you want to get involved, and you're an undergraduate, talk to Kevin here. Do you mind waving? Oh. Hi. And he'll tell you how to get involved. And if you're a graduate student, or if you just want to come along, from 5 to 7 p.m. in the Elliott Lyman Room in Longfellow Hall of the Education School's campus, stand up and say, we're standing with these kids. We've got your back. Let's catch them before they jump. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> now, you don't have to be Barack Obama. Um, you know, the thing about this is that, that we say we're teaching public narrative, but we're not really. Uh, we're all hardwired for this. What we're doing much more is um, taking something that's implicit and making it explicit so we can be intentional about it. But it's the sort of thing we all, we all know how to do. So it's, it's taking that natural capacity and turning it into a craft so we can exercise it with intentionality. So what's the sequence here? What does he start with? A, a self, an us, or a now? Which is the, huh? A what? Now. Why is it a now? He tells the examples of what happened to those kids that want to jump from the bridge. And it's, is it abstract? No. Yeah, we know how many seconds it took. It's very con So he begins by confronting us with a now. And then he goes where? Where does he go from that? Self. So. Right, and he's, he's engaging us in, in, now we understand sort of who he is, where he, where he came from. That's, that's, yeah, no, that's great. See, the more the moment is made real, I mean, the more the moment is made accessible, the more we can enter into it and actually get the emotional teaching that's being done. Uh, it's, it's, so he goes to the self, then where does he go? To the us. And then where does he go? No. Well, wait a second, on his way back to now, doesn't he, doesn't he take a little stop along the way? goes back to the self again. Only this is the second. The first self is why. The second self is what? What happens in that second reference to self? When, when he decided to act. Yeah. Yeah. The urgency. There's an urgency there. And then he winds up, of course, with a now. And there's something very. So here, the, the structure is a bit different. It starts, it goes now, self, us, self, now. And so there's no, it isn't a formula. But there are threads or elements here. So now, yes? And I, I was really struck about how, in this, he, he was vulnerable, yeah. you know, and that's, and, and imperfect. I, I, I just came out, and I live in this world of privilege, and put it in there, and I just came out. 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So, so we're, we're getting his experience, but it's con connecting. With. Now, how does he do to us? Yeah. How many, how many, who else connected with that? That feeling of being alone, no one's got your back. You know, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's real. Yeah. This is those people hanging on the tree are your yeah. Could be your brother, your son, your daughter, your and your imagination goes to that tree and imagines the, 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 the body. He draws the picture of it there. See, it's so interesting. Yeah. I was just gonna say I, I really connected when you said that feeling in your stomach. Because we've all had whatever you know, disappointment or horror, you know, when you find there's something shocking. Begin to see how this works. Begin to see how this works, and and yeah, I think the us is so interesting because you know you could take an issue an issue in quotes. And you notice nobody here is talking about issues; they're talking about people. By the way, mm -hmm. talking about people, which is really a critical thing that a lot of advocacy groups need to learn mm -hmm. about people. These things, and he, he takes something that could be very very particularistic, and finds a way in which to invite us in to the experience. Not because we're all of that particular characteristic, but we've had that experience. See, the us is an experiential thing. It's not a categorical thing. It's like, how do I bring alive some sense of shared values in this, in this community, in this set of people? Now, they may not have 100% shared values, or even 50%, or even 40%, but there may be something that I can then uh, uh, bring alive, so they feel connected not only with me but with each other in this common place. That's what an us is about, and uh, I, I, he does this extraordinarily well. I mean, he did get an A. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was teaching with me again this fall, which is which was which was really great. But no, he does it extraordinarily well, and and, and so that we're all kind of there in that experience. We may have different feelings about the quote issue. But boy, we're there in that experience. And that makes the issue accessible in a way it would never be accessible if we weren't part of that experience. You see how? And then, and then does he just leave it up in the air at the end? What does he do? Well, there's basically two, right? If you're an undergraduate, go to that room, or, if, or, or go to Elliot Lyman room over here, and here's what we're going to do. It's very specific. It's very clear. There is a call to action. Uh, is there any hope? Where, where, there's a lot of challenge in this. Where, where is there hope? When did you experience hope in this? Yeah. Well, his message is, if I did you maybe, maybe you yeah. so many campaigns gets better. But is the hope, when do you start experiencing hopefulness in this whole thing? When you start talking about being a role model. Here's somebody who, who, who overcame this. See, often hope is not way out there in, in dreamy land. It's in, the evidence of, it's in the evidence of courage before us. It's in the evidence of possibility before us. It's making us evidence of possibility. And, and on this distance learning class I teach, we had this amazing experience yesterday. Uh, people can see each other. I mean, we use WebEx, and so uh, not everybody can see everybody all the time, but it's a visual presence. Uh, a woman named Perubo from Kenya has been working in rural Kenya on a campaign uh, fighting um, uh, uh, female genital mutilation. Her, her organizing project is developing 10 leaders to work in this community. Uh, but uh, she, uh, she told her story over the internet, uh, linking it to the Boko Haram and calling on people to join her. Uh, there, were, there were protests uh, on the May 15th across Africa on this. And it was an, an amazing moment um, uh, through cyberspace. And when she called on people to join her, we couldn't stand up, you know. Uh, she said, everybody, please send me your email, and we will launch a joint petition. And on the chat, on the thing, it exploded with emails. And there was like this sense of usness that was really remarkable. It was really remarkable. 
uh, what this kind of real-time co-presence, even over that medium, how powerful that can be. That was hopeful. So, so hope is often right here. It's not way out there. Yes? Well, just a moment. His example struck me as having overcome fear uh, and, and experienced liberation and uh, the excitement of action. And that, that model that he created uh, helps people get past that initial fear of action and say, hey, not only is this, am I brave enough, but I'm also uh, opportunistic enough yeah. to take action. Yeah. It's not something necessarily where I'm putting my head in the news, but I'm actually liberating myself. Yeah. From the straight well, I, I think that's a great observation. That's often what's involved, isn't it? I mean, often the decision to act is often one of getting out of your own straight act, straight track. It's often yourself that's holding you back. It's not the needs and the opportunities. They're often out there. And so how you acquire that gift of hope, of, of, it's, of enabling others to access that sense of hopefulness, I think that's what charisma, quote, is all about in reality. But it's a capacity we all have capacity we all have. It's not like some visited upon some <coughs> unique human being. We, we, we're equipped with this. Yes? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, you know, compelling, fascinating, gripping stuff. I really had two questions. I'll limit myself to one. When you talked about Moses, you imitated two different voices. Yes. Um, as I was thinking about the juxtaposition of the two videos we saw, I was struck that both speakers uh, had very strong voices, yeah. and they both had a very similar cadence yeah. uh, in terms of how they presented their, their ideas. Yeah. How much difference does that make yeah. in the effectiveness? Of it's a great question. You know, it's a great question. One we've had, uh, we're doing a, a study right now. Uh, we've had 2,500 people look at 50 videos from the class to see what connects and what doesn't connect. Mm -hmm. And there was real convergence on the one they thought was most effective and the one that was least effective. The one they thought was most effective was almost in a monotone, but it was real. It was, it was, a re it was it, the guy was talking about real experience, lived experience. The authenticity came through. The one they thought was least effective was a woman with uh, all these uh, flourishes and oratorical tricks and, and everybody saw right through it. See, uh, the first time I taught this class, a student from India, Gianti Ravi, somebody said, oh, this is about how you package yourself. And she said, no, no, this isn't about how you apply a gloss from the outside. It's about how you bring out the glow from the inside. Mm -hmm. There is a power of authenticity. Mm -hmm. And often we don't know quite how to access it and communicate it because we're doubtful of our capacity to do that. And we think we need all those flourishes when actually it can be counterproductive. That's not to say Dr. King had a great gift. And you know it's a wonderful form of participation and communication, but you know we're capable. We're capable of this. So we've got about one minute here left to go in time. What are some of your takeaways from this uh, this session uh, today? I, I do want to say in the handout there's a last part here about how you can. Uh, it's a little worksheet for you to sit down and work on your own story. Uh, and had we had more time. I would have asked each of you to do that and turn to your neighbor and start sharing a personal story about why you're here to this thing, this place, at this time. And I think you'd find it really interesting. Really interesting. And of course, if we don't have time for that, I'd urge, I'd urge you to do No, then people say, oh, phew. Actually, 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 I would call on somebody to tell the work. So, but given that, what are some of your takeaways from what we were able to do uh, in this uh, time we had together? What are some takeaways? You have to have takeaways from Kennedy School, otherwise, you know. <laughs> takeaways. The, yeah. The three phrases from Hillel that I was left to hear five years ago. Ah. Especially the last one, not now, when. Yeah, not now, when. sense of urgency. Okay, good. What else? Other takeaways from today? Yeah. Um, for me, I think uh, being confident enough to have taken the time to know your story, yeah. as well as accepting your story. Uh, um, yeah. It's really important. Yeah, other takeaways, yes? Emotions are essential for action. Yeah, absolutely. Emotion, motion, it's the same word. Other takeaways, yeah? So, you actually did this exact structure with us here. You started with you. It's a show the story of somehow of the now and the as good. Yeah, that's your name. It's not good. But like there is a call to action. Like I feel called to actually even implicitly to work on the story yeah. and to, 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 to very good. Change. 
Maybe like to come and help. Maybe like to come and help. Let's get a couple of other takeaways. A couple of other takeaways. Yes. Yeah, see, there's this popular thing this, of marketing people's stories. Right. I think it's obscene yeah. because it objectifies and, and exploits. That, that's not what the, this is about. It's exercising agency. It is the capacity for agency and inspiring agency in others, and that's what this whole thing is about. And so last comment. Well, I'm a Democrat, and I work with the party, and I don't want to lose the gains that we've made. So I'm going to work with my candidate and see what happens. Well, well, be sure that Hillary learns how to tell her story because she couldn't in the last campaign. And poor John Kerry couldn't. And for those who say, I don't want to talk about myself in public life, folks, you got no choice because other people are going to tell your story for you unless you take authorship of it. And on that note, thank you very much. Good work and great to see you.